Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Live with the Hagley Historian. I am Lucas Clawson, historian at Hagley Museum and Library here in Wilmington, Delaware. And welcome to the fifth edition of Live with the Hagley Historian. This is the fifth program that we have done. So thank you all for sticking with me for these, and thank you all for tuning in today. This comes to you as part of our Hagley from Home initiative. Since you can't come to Hagley, and a lot of us can't make it to Hagley, we're going to try to bring content to you. So I'm coming to you live from my home studio here in Wilmington, Delaware. Today's topic is one that is pretty pertinent to the Hagley Museum and Library, the brief introduction to the DuPont family and DuPont Company. Because when you come to Hagley Museum and Library, the thing that you see is the ruins of the powder yards, the DuPont Black Powder Company, as well as the DuPont Ancestral Home, built in 1802, a few workers' homes. But then the DuPont Family and Company collections are the core of our library collections. So this is a pretty important thing for us, and one of the things to note, too, is that there's a lot of history that I'm going to cover today, over 100 years worth. So uh, this is indeed going to be a brief introduction. There are a lot of people, a lot of things that I'm, I'm going to leave out, and that's a deliberate choice. So uh, that way you'll know that I'm not going to be talking about some of uh, like E.I. and Sophie DuPont's children and other DuPont family members. We're just going to talk on kind of a high level here to give you a, a good overview of what is you know, what, what we do, how the DuPont family chose to come to the United States, and how the DuPont company got started. I'll dig in a little deeper in some of the later episodes, so don't worry. We're going to circle back and get to some of the detail work on this. But without further ado, let's move into today's program, a brief introduction to the DuPont family and the DuPont company. Our story begins... On January 1st, 1800, with this vessel called the American Eagle, the DuPont family left France in this vessel, and it was apparently a pretty long and arduous journey, one that they weren't expecting to be so long and arduous. What well, was supposed to be a couple of weeks' journey ended up taking over a month, that they ended up running out of a lot of food along the way. The ship leaked terribly. It was a, a really awful voyage, but the DuPont family first saw sight of the United States on January 1st, 1800, and then landed a couple of days later in Newport, Rhode Island, and then from there made their way through New Jersey and into Delaware. But let's take a step back before we get them to the United States and ask a question, why leave France? So why would the DuPont family choose to leave their home, leave uh, everything that they had known in Europe, and decide that they want to come to the United States? Let's start by introducing a few characters, the main one being Pierre Samuel Dupont de Nemours. He's the Dupont paterfamilias. He's the, the head honcho, if you will, of the Dupont family. His oldest son is Victor Marie Dupont and Gabrielle de Lafitte de Pelleport Dupont. Uh, that, uh, Victor Dupont is a pretty important character uh, to our story, but also in, in the larger history of things that uh, during the time period that we're talking about, he ended up... Uh, being a, a French diplomat, so he spent a lot of his time in the French diplomatic corps that he uh, was first posted to Philadelphia and then himself became consul to Charleston, South Carolina in the 1790s. So uh, I mean, a lot of the time during the deliberations, the DuPont family's deliberations to come to the United States, he was actually already here. So he had a good knowledge of what was going on in the States. His wife, Gabrielle, ended up becoming quite the socialite in Charleston, and uh, her letters and letters back and forth to one of her friends ended up becoming a, a quite a wonderful source to uh, learn about what life was like in the United States during that time period. So this is the early American Republic, the 1790s. Another set of people that are pretty important to our story is Eliotter Irene Dupont and his wife Sophie Madeleine Dalmas Dupont. So E.I. Dupont is the person who starts the Dupont Powder Yards, but I introduce him here, that way you know some of the main characters, and these are the main people that we're going to deal with. Pierre Samuel Dupont de Nemours, Victor Marie Dupont, Gabrielle Dupont, Eliotter Irene Dupont, and Sophie Madeleine Dalmas Dupont. So, again, these are the main people that we are going to focus on. In France, this was their home. It was called the Bois de Fosse in Chavannes, France. It's in a district called Nemours, which is about an hour south of Paris. The drawing you see here was done 
by one of E.I. DuPont's daughters, Victorine DuPont. And so this shows what the house actually looked like. This is a pretty neat little drawing, which is in our collections at Hagley, and it's tiny. The thing is only maybe about that big, a really small piece, but gives you a good sense of what their house looked like. The P.S. DuPont was a, a pretty important character in France leading up to the 1790s. He had worked his way up as an apprentice watchmaker, and uh, because of his political and economic thinkings, got the attention of a lot of important people in France. He was part of what's called the Physiocratic Movement, which was a, a line of political, educational, economic thinkers in France, which were some of the movers and shakers in the run-up to the beginning of the French Revolution in 1789. So Pierre Dupont, Pierre Samuel Dupont, is, is working his way up through the ranks, and so his two young sons are kind of following him through all this and all the ins and outs in Paris. P.S. Dupont Benamore also had a print shop in Paris, where a lot of his ideas were able to, to get out. So he published uh, quite a bit of some of his friends and colleagues' work, a lot of his own works, many of those which you can see in our collections in Hagley and are printed in published materials collections. So once the French Revolution really got rolling in 1789, and then the subsequent reign of terror, the DuPont family are neck deep, no pun intended, in all of this. During the storming of the Bastille, both E.I. DuPont and Pierre Samuel DuPont were members of the French National Guard, so they defended the Bastille against the storming. That They weren't firmly necessarily on the side of Louis XVI, although they traveled in his circles, but they were, were definitely part of the group that got identified as being someone the French revolutionaries were in some ways against. And so during the Reign of Terror in 1793-94, when the guillotine was used pretty Pretty prolifically, the uh, DuPont family, as we'll, we'll talk a little bit here, uh, were, were pretty deep in what was going on. So they had a lot of reason to be apprehensive during this time period. So as mentioned, the DuPonts knew King Louis XVI and were branded as being friends of Louis XVI. Although they weren't really close, and, and DuPont de Namur wasn't, P.S. DuPont de Namur wasn't, uh, one of the people at court, he was definitely somebody that King Louis XVI knew of, knew well. Louis XVI brought him in as a political, judicial, economic advisor and allowed him to travel throughout Europe, including to Sweden and to the court of Baden in Germany, to be a judicial advisor and to be an economic advisor. So his, he, he was in these, these larger circles of, again, movers and shakers within the French government. But his Relation to Louis XVI, P.S. DuPont's relation to Louis XVI definitely brought him in the crosshairs of the revolutionaries, particularly during the Reign of Terror in 1793-94. Another person which plays prominently into all this, and these people that, uh, that, that the DuPont family were actually friends with, was Antoine Laurent Lavoisier. So Lavoisier is a pretty important person in the wider world and not just France because he's someone who's known as the father of modern chemistry. He is a person who uh, started to uh, think about doing chemical experiments in a way that you could replicate them, using a scientific method to uh, do experiments and to think about how you approach chemistry and science. And so uh, ended up becoming a pretty prominent person. He started... Uh, a lot of work into what's called saltpeter, a main ingredient of black powder, which was a pretty important substance throughout Europe because you need it to make black powder, and ended up as head of the Ministry of, of Saltpeter and Gunpowder. Uh, so he's one of the people who helped make sure that France had an adequate supply of black powder uh, during his lifetime. But he also was known as someone close to Louis XVI, and uh, what was called a rent farmer, and this was a person who collected rents on behalf of the king. So uh, he came under the crosshairs in the big way of the revolutionaries and was executed in 1794 at the age of 50. His death sentence is pretty incredible. It goes on for about 17 pages, and we do have a copy of Loisier's death sentence at Hagley. It's, it's a pretty amazing document, but they had it out for him in a big way. But he's Important to the story because he is one of the people that DuPont de Namur knew well, and because of this association, DuPont de Namur ended up in this place, the La Force prison in Paris. So this was considered one of the steps you made toward the guillotine during the terror. 
that uh, because of DuPont Denimore's connections, his political writings, he ended up there. E.I. DuPont did not. He carried on the uh, printing press in Paris until the revolutionaries broke the printing shop up, came in and broke the presses, tore the place all to pieces. So Sophie Dalmas DuPont, E.I. DuPont's wife, ends up becoming a pretty important person throughout this time because she was able to sneak correspondence into DuPont Denimore in prison and then sneak his correspondence back out and also taking him food, writing materials, other sorts of things. So she did that. She also kept the Bois de Fosse estate rolling uh, while E.I. DuPont was trying to keep the printing shop going and then while DuPont Denimore was in Paris in, in the La Force prison. So the Pont de Nemours did not lose his head. The main person who accused him was Robespierre, that uh, Dupont de Nemours' stroke of luck was that Lo Robespierre lost his head before Dupont de Nemours did. So Dupont de Nemours was eventually released from La Force prison and went back to his broken print shop. So at this point, you would think the decision to come to America seems pretty clear. Or does it? So I want to, to push on this a little bit and argue to you today that I don't think the reason they left France was because of the revolution or because of the terror. What I think, why they chose to move to America, had to do with something else entirely, something that is precipitated by the revolution, but not, but not something that is a direct consequence of it. They came to the United States to seek business prospects. One of the things that is uh, that Dupont de Nemours was known for during his lifetime was being kind of the ultimate plotter and schemer. He's someone who, uh, and I don't mean that in a bad way, I mean it such that he's able to come up with ideas and really get out and beat the bushes and uh, get funding, get financing, come up with these ideas and push businesses forward, push ideas forward. And because he knew practically everybody, uh, one of them being Jacques Necker, who was the French minister of the Exchequer, the finance minister. He's someone who was pretty influential in being able to open up the coffers of France, open up the French treasury, but knew a lot of other people with a lot of money that could help push ideas forward, help push business ideas forward. Another influential person for Dupont de Nemours is the Madame de Stael, who in her own right was a pretty wealthy woman, but influential because she was one of the leading people in Paris's salon culture. So this is where people would sit in coffee houses, people's parlors, talk about political ideas, educational ideas. She organized quite a few of these, many of them attended by the physiocrats, of which, again, Dupont de Nemours was a member. So he got her attention and was able to therefore get the attention of a lot of other movers and shakers in this movement, but also a lot of incredibly wealthy people that she knew. So he was able to drum up a lot of interest in taking his show on the road, so to speak, so he formed a company called P.S. DuPont de Nemours, Father and Sons and Company. And he came up with a prospectus of a lot of things that he wanted to try, not in France, but in the United States. And so his prospectus had several things on it, among them real estate and land speculation, dry goods, printing and publishing, black powder manufacturing, all sorts of things. There were nine main things. Black powder was seventh on that list, so that was pretty far down the things that they wanted to try in the United States. But why the United States of all places? Why come there and not somewhere else in Europe or Britain or some other place? A lot of this had to do with this guy, Thomas Jefferson. So DuPont de Nemours became friends with Thomas Jefferson whenever Jefferson was consul to France during the American Revolution. So this was during the 1770s, 1780s. So DuPont de Nemours got to know them. They found that their political, educational, economic way of thinking lined up pretty well and became fast friends. That Jefferson and DuPont de Nemours ended up carrying on a healthy correspondence with each other for the rest of both of their lives. So up until DuPont de Nemours' death in 1817. And this Exchange is part of the collection at Hagley. It's an incredible set of correspondence that covers absolutely everything from the geopolitics of the world to specific economic things to how much they like sheep. And we'll come back to this, sheep as in an economic opportunity in sheep. But they also talked about friendly things. They became actually, actually good friends, you know, and, you, and this comes out in their writing. An interesting thing to point out is that DuPont de Nemours always wrote to Jefferson in French, and Jefferson always wrote back to DuPont de Nemours in English. So that's a, a pretty neat little tidbit for you there. And so the DuPont family, another thing to point out too, were bilingual. They did know 
English well, and they were able to read it, write it, speak it well, and as well as French. So a lot of people in this time period knew it well, and this shows up in, in a lot of their papers. So Thomas Jefferson saw the DuPont family as, as somebody, a group of people who could come to the United States and help build the American economy, keeping in mind this is the 1790s into the turn of the 19th century, the year 1800. So this is when the United States was trying to get itself built up, building its economy, trying to, to get to be as Jefferson wanted it, an export economy rather than an import economy. And this is one of the things that helps his ideas line up with DuPont de Nemours really well. So Jefferson is greasing the gears of progress, as it were, to try to get the DuPont family to the United States. And, and it's in a lot of ways responsible for talking them into coming to the United States. So once they get here, again, they started off in Newport, Rhode Island, went through New Jersey, set up shop in New York for a couple of their businesses. And it's important to note out, note to you that practically all of these businesses failed. So Victor DuPont ran the dry goods operation, which was run out of New York City. He had the incredible poor fortune of selling a lot of dry goods to Napoleon in the French army on Saint-Domingue. So uh, whenever that uh, failed uh, French expedition had to get the heck out of Dodge, so to speak, Victor DuPont asked Napoleon for a payment, and Napoleon told him to get lost. So that pretty much put the dry goods business out of business, and Victor DuPont had to move out of New York City and go to Angelica, New York, which was out on the frontier at that point. So that's in upstate New York. So that failed spectacularly, as did land speculation, that a lot of people lost a lot of money in the 1790s, early 1800s in the United States over land speculation, where two or three pieces of property like in Kentucky, where it sold two or three times. And so uh, it was a hard time trying to figure out who bought what. A lot of people, again, lost money on this. The DuPont family did, too. That They worked their way down the list. One after another, all of the businesses were incredibly unsuccessful. Except, yep, you guessed it, black powder manufacturing. The black powder manufacturing set up by E.I. DuPont in Wilmington, Delaware. So before we launch into what happens with the start of the DuPont Company, let's rehash a little bit. We've got the DuPont family to the United States. They know a lot of people, not the least of which is Thomas Jefferson, a lot of the main political movers and thinkers in Europe. So uh, the correspondence list of P.S. DuPont de Nemours reads like a who's who of anybody who is anybody in Europe and the United States. So these people know a lot of people. They're able to organize a lot of financing. They know a lot of stuff coming to the United States. So them coming here is, again, seeking that economic opportunity and not really so much escaping from anything, uh, because you'll see that uh, later on, the Pont de Nemours ended up going back to France and becoming head of the French General Assembly. The reason why he eventually left France for good is that he had the distinction of signing Napoleon's act of abdication. So whenever Napoleon escaped from the Isle of Elba, the Pont de Nemours decided it was best for his health to not be in Europe whenever Napoleon came back to uh, continental Europe. So he came back in 1815 and stayed until his death in 1817. So they end up doing a lot of moving back and forth, but the economic opportunity is what's important. So something to point out to you about black powder manufacturing, too, is that E.I. DuPont studied at Lavoisier's school under uh, why would that, that he started at the Ministry of Powder and Saltpeter. So E.I. DuPont studied there 18, 1787 to 1790. And what did you learn at Lavoisier's school, you might ask? One is that you learn chemistry because, of course, remember, he's the father of modern chemistry. He's teaching folks who were there about how to do chemical work, especially refining the raw ingredients that went into black powder. But more importantly for our story, what you learned at the school was how to manage a business. So keep that in mind. It's about how to manage a business. So one of the things that Lavoisier impressed on his students is you need to coordinate Things like, where are you going to get raw materials? Where are you going to get financing? Where are you going to set up shop? Was this going to be a good place to move materials in, move materials out? How are you going to physically set up your plant? You know, all of these things are questions that Lavoisier pushed his students to think about. And so E.I. DuPont was thinking about these while he studied there. So this is one of the things he brought to the table in setting up shop in Wilmington, Delaware. So we've gotten ourselves to the point of black powder manufacturing. Let's ask the question, why come to Wilmington, Delaware? Why Wilmington, Delaware of all places?
So Delaware ends up being an excellent place to set up a manufacturing business in the late 18th and early 19th century, and this is so for a couple of reasons. One is that Wilmington has good proximity to a lot of important places in the United States during this era. So Wilmington is not that far away from Philadelphia, not that far away from New York, close to Baltimore, and close to the national capital in Washington, D.C. So some of the importance of all this is that with New York, you've got an economic center. Philadelphia, you've got an economic center. Baltimore at that time was a big economic center. And again, D.C. with the national capital. So it's a lot about moving people, moving goods. So the DuPont company can purchase raw materials at the uh, open markets in Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York. But also it's about moving money as well. So uh, the financial capital of the United States during that time was in Philadelphia. So the Bank of the United States was based there. One of the questions you have to ask is how do you move money in the late 18th and early 19th century? You can't just go to the ATM machine. You can't just send somebody a check for goods and purchases or goods and, and services that you buy. So you have to use complex credit instruments and it's a lot of a faith-based economy. You have to know people and they have to trust you. And so a lot of this is about a face-to-face -face interaction with uh, some of these, these people, but also being able to take these credit instruments and do something with them. So being close to Philadelphia and the Bank of the United States is an important choice for the DuPont Company. But then also the ability to move money, move goods around New York, around Baltimore. So it's a, it's a good place to be because you're, you're pretty much in the center of East Coast American economic life and manufacturing life during that era. Another important thing to point out in Wilmington, you know, why Wilmington, Delaware, is that you've got two big water courses that are of a big help. You've got the Delaware Bay to the north, which is the upper red line you see on your screen, and you've got the Chesapeake Bay to the south, which is the lower red line you see on the screen. So why are these bays so important? So remember, you've got to get raw materials in, and so whenever you're making black powder, you're not buying 10 or 15 pounds of raw materials at a time. You're buying hundreds of thousands of pounds of raw materials at a time. The best way to move them is by water. So being close to a good water source to get these raw materials in is pretty important. But also with black powder, one of the things to point out is that's heavy manufacturing. Heavy is in literally because you're making stuff that's literally heavy, but then heavy, but it takes a lot of energy to, to turn it. And that's not where the bays come into play, but it's where they come into play to be able to move these goods out. So DuPont wanted to be close to good transshipment points. So all of the materials that DuPont shipped out, black powder that they shipped out that went north, would go down the Delaware Bay and then up toward New York and all points north that way. Everything that would go south, they would carry by wagon to Elkton, Maryland, and then ship out on the Chesapeake Bay south. So everything that would go to the southeastern United States and out in that direction. So having good access to waterways, water transportation, was one of the reasons to come to Wilmington, Delaware. Another aspect of why Wilmington, back to water power. So hold on to that idea of black powder being a heavy industry. You need a lot of water power to be able to turn the machinery, all the heavy machinery. So Wilmington sits right on a fall line. The red line you see on your screen is approximately where the fall line is located. So that's a kind of a geologic break in the landscape where you have a higher elevation and a lower elevation and then whenever water rolls across it you can use that water to make power. So being able to dig mill races, tap into water as in streams, rivers, those sorts of things to be able to power your machinery. So Wilmington, Delaware is in a good place because it's right on the fall line. There were a lot of other businesses that came to Wilmington for that exact reason. So it's an excellent place for manufacturing because you have access to all this water power. And one last thing to say about Wilmington, Delaware, and part of the reason the DuPont family chose to come here, was because there was a large French expatriate community already living in Wilmington. And so this is important because uh, during that period, you know, you want to know people, have a community to go to. So there's people who have a shared history, a shared culture that you're around. Another important part of the decision was that the, in that point in the United States, you could not own property unless you were a naturalized citizen or a natural born citizen of the United States. So the DuPont family were not. They ended up getting someone to purchase property for them and then hold it in trust 
until the DuPont family could become naturalized citizens and transfer title of the property over to them. So that's a, another good reason to come to Wilmington, Delaware. So E.I. DuPont did a lot of hunting about, found the piece of property where Hagley sits now, founded the E.I. DuPont de Namur and Company in 1802, and purchased the property in 1802, started building the powder yards then. The drawing that you see is by Charles Dalmas. That was E.I. DuPont's wife, Sophie's brother. He did a lot of drawings of uh, scenes on the Brandywine of the Black Powder Mills. So this is uh, the earliest drawing, the earliest known depiction of the DuPont Black Powder Mills from 1806. So it shows the main house in the background, but the factory in the foreground. So this is the piece of property that E.I. DuPont purchased. He called it Eleutherian Mills. So the official name is E.I. DuPont de Namur and Company, but the colloquial name was Eleutherian Mills, and that's what he called his house. That's what we still call the, the house today at Hagley, the Eleutherian Mills residence. Once the powder yards got rolling, production commenced in 1803 with refined saltpeter, which is one of the largest ingredients for black powder, and started producing black powder in 1804. The drawing that you see is from 1818. This is the earliest map of the powder yards, drawn by a fellow named Gabriel Deniso, who was a representative of one of the investors in the DuPont Company that uh, came from France to the United States to look at what was going on, make sure that the investments were sound. So we have the establishment of the DuPont Company in Delaware. One of the things happening concurrently, which is pretty important to our story, and here's something that uh, many of you may not know, that uh, DuPont de Namur, P.S. DuPont de Namur, played a pretty important role in the Louisiana Purchase. And I bring this up in the story as an example of how closely connected the DuPont family was to larger events in world history and United States history, but just some of the people that they knew. So in 1802, 1803, the Louisiana Territory shifted hands from Spain to France. President Thomas Jefferson was worried that the United States was going to lose navigation of the Mississippi River and access to the port of New Orleans. So this is an important way to get goods and services people moving about in the United States interior during that period. This is on our western frontier. He briefly considered going to war with France over the, the Louisiana Territory, over the, the Mississippi River and the port of New Orleans but had the good sense to write and ask people's opinions of what he should do. One of the people that he wrote to was Pierre Samuel de Pont de Namur, who was back in France by that point. De Pont de Namur's advice to him, and I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit, was that uh, Napoleon has bigger fish to fry on the continent of Europe. Again, this is 1802-1803. Make him an offer he can't refuse, and I'll help you negotiate the financing, which is essentially a lot of what happened. So it's not because of de Pont de Namur that the Louisiana Purchase happened, but DuPont de Namur played a large role in helping Jefferson think through what to do, but then also, again, negotiating financing with the French government. Remembering back to Jacques Necker, the French minister of the Exchequer, DuPont de Namur was able to talk with him and help get good terms for the United States in purchasing the Louisiana Territory. So DuPont de Namur, in addition to corresponding with Thomas Jefferson, also did so with James Madison, then Secretary of State, and James Monroe, who at that point was the American consul to France. So this is a pretty important piece of what's going on with the DuPont family, DuPont company, during this time period. So remember back that I uh, mentioned sheep. Sheep were a imp pretty important part of what's going on with the DuPont company because they were thinking about things to do other than just black powder. So remember back to uh, talking with Jefferson about wanting to have an export rather than import an economy. So one of the things they were thinking about was all the things you could set up in the United States that could be self-sufficient, one of those being textiles. And so uh, the DuPont company th was, was trying to think through, and E.I. DuPont especially, what can we do to help get the economy more firmly established in the United States? So they wanted to get into textiles. Great Britain had a lockdown on this during that time. They wanted to try to figure out how to get the United States into it. So the reason sheep are so important is that uh, Merino sheep out of Spain were a pretty important source for wool during the 19th century. So they wanted to try to get a herd into the United States. E.I. DuPont bought a herd of Merino sheep, had them at his Winterthur property, now where the Winterthur Museum stands, and uh, built this mill depicted in the drawing, the Louvier Mill, 
which is right across the river from the black powder manufactory, set up specifically to make woolen cloth. So they had a hard time getting things going. This was around 1808, because don't forget that Britain had a lockdown on the textile market in the world during that time. One of the important things that happens, and the DuPont uh, woolen venture was able to take advantage of, was Thomas Jefferson's embargo of Great Britain, and subsequently the War of 1812. So a lot of manufacturers saw that this was going to be a way to provide cover for American textiles and, and getting a, a toehold in the United States and, and without the competition of Great Britain. So this is when the DuPont Company not only pushed the Louvier woolen mill, but they invested in a couple of other textile mills on the Brandywine River, one of them called DuPont Bedouin Company, which uh, is the, uh, the, the label that you see here on the screen, but also another one called Duplanty McCall and Company, which ran the Henry Clay Mill, now our visitor center at Hagley. So there's a lot of buildings on the Brandywine, which later got pulled back into the DuPont Company, but they started off as DuPont Investments in the textile industry on the Brandywine River. So the label that's in front of you is a pretty important one, and I'm going to walk you through some of the bits and pieces, but this shows you the confidence that they had in the, the textile ventures. So the little guy that you see at center with the wings, that's supposed to be Great Britain. And so he's protecting himself with a piece of cloth. The guy on the left side with the bow and arrow is an allegory of the United States and American. So he's shooting arrows at Great Britain, trying to, to penetrate this the shield. But notice behind Great Britain is a sheep, and this is Don Pedro. This was the sire of the Merino sheep herd E.I. DuPont had on the Brandywine. So Don Pedro becomes a pretty important character in a lot of ways and is still a, a character that's thrown out even among some, some DuPont family members uh, during that time and, and, and even, even still now. And so the guy sitting on Don Pedro's back is another allegory of America, clipping Great Britain's wings with a set of sheep shears. But this kind of gives you an idea of how they expected a lot of this to work out during Jefferson's embargo and during the War of 1812. They felt that all this was going to be good cover to help American industry get a toehold and be able to push the American economy forward. This is also, during the War of 1812, a reason for the DuPont Powder Yards, the Black Powder Company, to make its first major expansion program. The beginning parts of the Powder Yard, the Eleutherian Mills section, which I've already mentioned, is circled here. The, uh, the house that you can see within that circle is the Eleutherian Mills residence. So that's the, uh, the DuPont family home. This was initially about 66 acres where the black powder manufactory was located. This was the first part of the powder yards. And so when you come to take the tour today, you can see some of this. You can see some of the ruins of the powder yards here. In 1813, E.I. DuPont purchased another section of property which was called the Hagley Yard. So this was another piece of property just downriver from the Eleutherian Mills Manufactory. This was the first, again, major expansion program. So they were able to use this to double the size of the powder yards. And so it's a couple of things going on here. It's not just about war that DuPont is, is making this expansion. It's about keeping their hand in the civilian market, that one of the things to remember about war is that it's uncertain. You don't know who's going to win. You don't know how long it's going to last. You don't know how it's going to turn out. And also military contracting during the 19th century can be a profitable thing, but it's not necessarily a profitable thing. But there's a lot of uncertainty built into this. There's a huge demand for black powder that's really taking off in this era in the civilian market for things like construction and mining. So they wanted to keep their hands in that market, but then also keep up their military contracts as well. During the War of 1812, DuPont became the prime contractor for the United States Army. So uh, they were sending a lot of their powder to the Frankfurt Arsenal in Philadelphia that made its way into the U.S. Army's hands. Uh, but they also wanted to keep their hands in the civilian market as well. So the E.I. DuPont purchased the Hagley property in 1813, opened the powder yard there in 1814. So this started the company's expansion downriver to uh, what would end up being about two and a half miles of the Brandywine at its height. So the Hagley Yard, another thing to circle back on on this, the reason it was called Hagley, is the piece of property already had the name Hagley when E.I. DuPont purchased it. Uh, that we think that it's named after an estate in Great Britain, uh, 
that the, the person who owned it before E.I. DuPont may have, have named it that after the estate in Great Britain. We don't know for sure, but that's a name that the property already had when E.I. DuPont purchased it. So the War of 1812 gives this first major expansion program. So Brandywine businesses are, are doing pretty well up through the War of 1812 and just at the end. But one of the problems of the end of the War of 1812 is now that we're no longer at war with Great Britain, cheap British stuff can come flowing back into the United States. And so that ends up putting a lot of the textile mills out of business. So that's uh, why a lot of these mills ended up getting incorporated back into the DuPont company. The DuPont had a in major investment in a lot of, of these textile mills on the Brandywine. So the map that you see here, I know it's a little small, but I, I put this up for a reason. What this is showing in the top left corner is the Brandywine River, where it starts on the border between Delaware and Pennsylvania, and then as it flows almost all the way out into the Delaware River. So at the top left, you're seeing the Rockland paper mills, and as you move down river, the next little set of dots you see is the DuPont Black Powder Factory. If you look closely on the river, you'll see a bunch of little dots. And what those represent are either businesses that were on the Brandywine in 1816 or where businesses could go, where water wheels could go, where water power could go. This was, map was uh, made by a group called the Brandywine Mill Seats Company, E.I. DuPont and the DuPont Company being a lead member, to promote manufacturing on the Brandywine but then also in turn to lobby within the Delaware state government, the United States government, for favorable legislation on trade, taxes, tariffs, those sorts of things. So as time goes on, again, the DuPont Company had these investments in these smaller mills, and then as they went out of business, they ended up getting pulled into the DuPont Company. So like our visitor center, Henry Clay Mill, started off as a cotton spinning, cotton textile mill, eventually became a keg production facility but by the 1850s. That one held on a little longer. But the Louvier mill that I showed you earlier uh, went out of business pretty quickly, ended up becoming a keg production facility for the DuPont company. So a lot of them become storage or corollary parts of the DuPont manufacturing, or DuPont black powder manufacturing group. So after the War of 1812, this is a big time for the DuPont Company. This is when DuPont became a national business. So what made DuPont? You have black powder. This is what they're making, but not all black powder is the same. It breaks down into two classes. You have what's called propellants, which is what you think of in gunpowder, so that's what you use in cannons, firearms, those sorts of things. But uh, the other type of black powder is called explosives, and this is what you use for things like mining and construction. And a majority of DuPont's business before the American Civil War and even after was with explosives. It's making explosives. And so who used it? Why did they use it? And, and what does this mean? Why the 1820s to the 1860s? So one of the things to keep in mind for American history during this time is that we're moving west, westward expansion, building a lot of canals, building a lot of railroads. So you need black powder as an explosive to blow out rail beds to blow out where canals are going to go, use it for construction, excavation. But mining is really important. They end up becoming, the mining industry ends up becoming the single biggest buyer of black powder during the 19th century. So particularly coal mines, one of the largest purchasers of DuPont powder, ended up being the anthracite region in Pennsylvania. And so coal is really important, not just because black powder is used to extract coal, but because coal gets used in railroads, coal gets used in steamships. It's an incredibly important commodity during this point. So black powder is incredibly important on top of that because it helps you extract coal. This is a, a really important thing to think of and to keep in mind when you think about why the DuPont Company ends up becoming a, a pretty important company during this time and how they became a national business. So this is what helps promote the expansion of the DuPont Company and what sets them in a good position to become the leading black powder manufacturer in the United States. Another piece of the story during this time has to do with this guy, Lamont DuPont. So he was one of the key people in the DuPont company during the middle of the 19th century, but one of his most important contributions for the purposes of our story today was coming up with what's called bee blasting powder and getting a patent for that on May 19, 1857. 
So what in the heck is bee blasting powder and why is that important? With regular black powder, the three main ingredients are saltpeter, which is potassium nitrate, charcoal, and sulfur. So potassium nitrate, uh, the saltpeter, is the largest ingredient by volume, and the main place to get it during that era was out of India. And keep in mind that India control was controlled by Great Britain. So if there was a war going on, something happened, you had to go through Britain, and they were increased prices exponentially depending upon how bad they felt you needed the saltpeter, which is fine, well, and good. Another ingredient that you could use is sodium nitrate. The problem is it's a little more hygroscopic, which means it absorbs water at a higher rate than sodium nitrate or uh, potassium nitrate, rather. So uh, Lamont Dupont figured out a way to make black powder with sodium nitrates, and he called it bee blasting powder, and also called soda powder. Part of why this is so important is that now you can get sodium nitrate out of Chile, get it out of Peru, get it out of South America. So now you're not having to pay to ship it halfway across the world. You can buy it within your own hemisphere. That's the substance that you really need. But also, you don't have to worry about going through Great Britain to get it. So why this is so important is this is something that drastically reduces the cost of the main type of black powder, explosive powders, that people are buying in the United States. So this is a big breakthrough for DuPont and something that helps continue to push the DuPont company to prominence. The first factory that DuPont built away from the Brandywine was near Scranton, Pennsylvania. They did so in 1859, and it was called the Wap Wallopin Mills. Say that three times fast, Wap Wallopin. What a great name for a black powder mill. Part of the reason this is so important, Scranton, Pennsylvania, you're right in the heart of anthracite country in the Pennsylvania coal fields. One of the reasons DuPont decided to build a factory there was that it's incredibly expensive to move black powder during the 19th century. Shippers were understandably not really happy about moving a substance that could potentially kill them. Remember, it is an explosive. If something goes wrong, it goes wrong pretty badly. So uh, shipping is expensive. If you can build a factory and make black powder close to where it's going to be sold, you can cut a lot of the cost out and so thereby save a lot of money in putting up a black powder factory. So this is an important step for the DuPont company, the Wap Wallopin Mills near Scranton, Pennsylvania. And these ran well into the 20th century under DuPont company control. So one of the many pieces of the pie here. By 1860, DuPont was a worldwide company, remembering that they're bringing in raw materials from around the world. They're still, even though they're getting sodium nitrate out of South America, they're still getting saltpeter from India. That's the main ingredient for propellant powders. You can't use sodium nitrate for, propellant, for uh, propellant powders, but you can use it for explosives. But in the end, they're bringing in raw materials from around the world, but they're also selling black powder back out around the world. So by 1860, DuPont had sales agencies throughout all of the continental United States. They had a main agency in Buenos Aires and Argentina, Singapore, and also Hong Kong, West Africa, Australia, everywhere but Europe. And the reason they never got a toehold in Europe is the black powder manufacturers in Britain, France, and Prussia had a lockdown on the European, the continental European market. So DuPont never got a big toehold there, but they were able to get a toehold around the world. So this is pretty important. DuPont ends up being a global company before you think of DuPont being a global company. And this is all you know, part of the steps in this process, the economic underpinning from whenever they got started in 1802, knowing a lot of people that could organize the finance and get them a good economic start, having smart business practices, being able to invest in uh, new machinery, get situated in a good place, able to pull back uh, some of these investments and turn them around into the main company that they were running during this time period, also figuring out new ways to make black powder like the bee blasting powder, building their factory near Scranton, Pennsylvania. All these are steps in the process that helped them by 1860 be a worldwide company and by 1860 the largest and leading black powder manufacturer in the United States. So I'm going to touch really, really briefly on the Civil War. I'll come back to uh, specifically the Civil War for uh, another session of Live with the Hagley Historian. But for today, we'll just say that DuPont was the largest producer of black powder for the Army and Navy during the American Civil War, that the company produced about 40% of all the powder that the Army and Navy 
ordered and ended up using during the war. And so God, by going on a 24-hour production schedule, they were able to manufacture over 1 million pounds of black powder per year from 1862 through 1864. And we're on set to do the same in 1865 had the war not ended. So this is a lot of black powder that's being manufactured, put into the war effort. And DuPont uh, manufactured all of this for the Union. It's important to say that DuPont absolutely positively did not, under any circumstances, sell to the Confederacy, that uh, Henry DuPont, who ran the company, felt strongly about that. And so any DuPont powder that made it into secessionist hands, it was either by confiscation from DuPont sales agents in the Southeast or by confiscation from American military posts in the Southeast. So this is a pretty important time for the DuPont company. And the war is pretty important for another reason. A bit of the aftermath of the war is that toward the end, the government bought way more powder than they ended up using. So by 1865, the government started selling this powder and surplus ammunition on the open market at well below market prices. So black powder that the government purchased for, say, 20 to 23 cents a pound, they turned around and sold for four and five cents a pound. So this severely oppressed, depressed the American black powder market. American manufacturers just did not know what to do about this, and you could probably understand we're not happy about all of this. So in 1872, the Gunpowder Trade Association got set up. This was the brainchild of Henry DuPont, who ran the company from 1850 to 1889 and Lamont DuPont, who we already mentioned, who was uh, one of the main people in the DuPont company during this period. The idea of the Gunpowder Trade Association was to band all of the major manufacturers together in order to do things like price fix. They could all get together and set a mutual price for how they were going to sell things, that they were going to divide up territories. So certain companies would sell to certain places, sell into certain industries that uh, these companies were going to purchase smaller companies for the purpose of absorbing them or, or closing them down altogether to limit competition. So this all sounds a bit nefarious, but in 1872 it was perfectly legal. There was not uh, an antitrust law in place at that point. There was uh, no sorts of laws put in place to, to do anything about this. So they, they, again, it was perfectly legal. They were able to set this up and do it. And where we're going to end the story today is by what, what happens by 1900, how DuPont became the main manufacturer in the United States. So remember, back to the Gunpowder Trade Association, the other largest members were the Hazard Powder Company out of Enfield, Connecticut, uh, Smith & Rand out of New York, and the Oriental Powder Company out of Portland, Maine, and had office, which had offices in Boston, Massachusetts. These were the main players that got together for the Gunpowder Trade Association plus a bunch of smaller companies throughout the United States. So as we mentioned, that uh, DuPont and these other companies bought smaller companies for the purpose of either absorbing them or closing them down entirely. So what DuPont ended up doing was pulling some of these companies in or buying a controlling interest in some of these companies, and then by 1900 they had purchased a controlling interest in all of their major competitors. So DuPont either owned their major competitors outright or owned controlling shares in their major competitors so that they dominated the entire propellants and explosives industry in the United States by 1900. So this is what sets DuPont up to become a, a major manufacturer in World War I, like we talked about last week, but also sets them up to make a big turn into the chemicals business and, and into a lot of different directions. So there's, there's a lot of history to cover here. I realize that in the 50 minutes, we've hit a large swath of time, and as I said, this is a, a brief introduction to the DuPont family and the DuPont company and how they got started in the United States. So I'll take a moment here and uh, look in the comments section to see if there are any questions, any uh, comments here. Um, if you've got any questions, uh, type them into the uh, comments section, and we can certainly flip back and take a look at a few of the slides that have been shown or uh, talk about any of the uh, issues or things that came up here. And uh, while we wait a second to see if anybody wants to chime in, I uh, want to make sure to let you know
keep track of what Hagley has going on by going to our website, www.hagley.org. We are closed to the public at the moment, so uh, please um, check with our website to see when we'll be open up again, see what else is going on. Also, go to the Hagley from Home tab, which is on the Hagley website, to see uh, educational videos, other sorts of stuff that we've got going on. All of the uh, Live with the Hagley Historian uh, sessions are being recorded, so we'll put them up there. Also, be sure to check out the Hagley Museum and Library Facebook page where you can see live events like mine that are going on, videos and other content, and uh, also keep track of uh, what we're doing and how we're doing it. So let me uh, check the uh, comments section here again. All right, well, if any of you think of anything that you are curious about, stuff that you want to know, more stuff you want to know based on today's talk, uh, just uh, type in a, a comment uh, after the live stream has ended today. I'll be sure to go through them and take a look at the comments there. You're also welcome to uh, contact us through our website, and uh, there's there's a, a form there called Ask Hagley, A-S-K-H-A-G-L-E-Y, so it's askhagley at hagley.org. If you've got any questions, you can uh, send them to that email. Uh, they'll route them over to me or someone else that can answer your question. Our reference team is always standing by for uh, your questions and comments, and we can uh, certainly address any questions that you have after that. But be sure to uh, check us out on Facebook, uh, like and share uh, what we've got going on. Also, um, just check up there for more content. I see we've got a couple of questions. Before we go, I'll, I'll jump in on this. Uh, Georgia asks, uh, could you say something about the book that I am working on? Uh, Georgia, you have uh, hit the nail on the head on something big for me. I am working on a book about Henry DuPont and his role in keeping the state of Delaware loyal to the Union during the Civil War, and I will not uh, steal my own thunder. That will be the subject of next week's talk. So uh, we'll circle back to that, and you can hear about it in a big way. And uh, Susan asks, who were some of the other French families in the Wilmington area when the DuPonts came to Wilmington? There was a, a family called the Bedoui family who ended up becoming uh, partners in the DuPont business, particularly a guy named Pierre Bedoui, who held the uh, DuPont powder factory property for E.I. DuPont until E.I. DuPont was able to become a naturalized citizen of the United States. Uh, there was also the Tussaud, uh, Anne -Marie, er, Anne Louis Tussaud, who was... Uh, and a major artillery officer in the uh, American Army during the Revolution, so this was another person that the DuPonts knew. Uh, there were also uh, several other families, um, and, and we can r run down a list of those. Uh, there's, there's plenty of information on that at Hagley's, so um, if, if you uh, want to follow up with that and know more about the French families, uh, definitely send me an email. I can answer that more thoroughly there. Well, thank you all for sticking with me this week. Uh, please uh, tune in for more. We'll be back next week, next Friday at 10 a.m. for more Live with the Hagley Historian. But uh, until next week, be well, everyone, and we'll come back at you with more Live with the Hagley Historian. Thanks for joining in.